Good morning. morning. Today we have three scripture readings from the Word of God. The first starts in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he answered. Am I my brother's keeper? James 5, 19 through 20. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. The Word of God for the people of God. As we continue our messages on Methodist distinctives, the one thing we're going to talk about is spiritual accountability. Being Methodist doesn't mean well, we believe what we do because John Wesley believed it. As I've said before, it's because we see it in Scripture. And if we don't see it in Scripture, I don't care if John Wesley said it, I don't care who said it. If I say it, if it's not backed up by Scripture, you are free to ignore it. Unless you're my wife and children. Then you should pay attention. How many of you think that really happened? Wait, I'm not going to ask that question. I don't want to know. But before we start in the, the, what has been historically called the Wesley class and band meetings, I want to start off looking at the Word of God. Because that's what we have to base our scriptures on. And when we look at the history of the bands and the classes of John Wesley, it's easy to say, oh yeah, that's just something they did in the past. But we need to understand the why. Is there a scriptural reason for doing what they did? And the question we have to ask, am I my brother's keeper? Or maybe the other way around, are they my keeper. You know, sometimes we, some people, they don't mind being their brother's keeper. They're glad to tell their brother or their sister uh, in the Lord or maybe actually everybody around them exactly what they think they ought to do. But for most of us, we don't like the second part of that. Is there somebody that needs to be keeping track of us? In our culture, especially in America, we think... More, very, very individualistic. It's my plan. It's my ideas. I can do what I want no matter what anybody else says. But is that scriptural? Is there a level of accountability we should have or that people should have to us? Many people use, say, you can't judge me. Or... Of course, these are taken out of context. If you're without sin, then you can talk to me. But we see in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse number 20, that God told Ezekiel, Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word that I speak and give warning. Give them warning from me. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron... So one person sharpens another. And earlier in the chapter it says, the wounds of a friend can be trusted, but the enemy multiplies kisses. And last one I think about, a good friend can tell you something, and they can be hurt, but they're doing it for your good. But if you've got somebody who's always complimenting, always saying how wonderful and nice, you're like, okay, what are they up to? You know, got to be careful. The Old Testament taught accountability. The prophets, Nathan and Gad, corrected David as needed. A host of other prophets and priests for other leaders were there saying, this is what we need to do. You need to pull it in line. You're going off the rails here. But what about the New Testament? New Testament says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, 
You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Another translation says you should restore them in a spirit of meekness. I don't really like that one. Because if you're trying to correct someone, you shouldn't come in like you're God. Because guess what? You're not. But you go with them in a spirit gently. Watch for yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. In this way you fulfill the law of Christ. We're supposed to help each other. Bear each other's burdens. We're not called to do it alone. Jesus said in Luke 17, 3, he says, if your brother or sister sin against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Let me ask you something. You can't rebuke someone if you can't tell them, hey, there's a problem. And of course, spirit, Scripture doesn't say that our job is just to correct other people when they go wrong, but also to help them grow. Help them be all they can be to steal a line from, I think it was the army who had that tagline years ago. Be all you can be. But God wants you to be all that you can be. He wants to be, you to be the best you you can be. And he uses one another to help us. He uses people around us to help us grow. To be what he wants us to be. There's a whole list of scriptures here I want to read from the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 15 through 16 says, Instead, speak the truth in love. By the way, listen to that part. If you're talking to someone about a problem, you speak the truth in love. How many of you know there's a difference? You can have somebody who's speaking the truth in love, and you can have people saying other things otherwise. As Christians, we need to speak the truth in love. We will grow to become, every, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body is joined together. By every supporting ligament and grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We all have a part. It's not just Jesus doing it all. We are called to help one another. Scripture we read a little while ago, or Jeremy read, it says, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore encourage, and build up, encourage one another and build up each other, just as in fact you are doing. I see that around here, and that's good. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 25 says, Let us hold unswerving to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Pastors usually use this scripture to say, you ought to be on church on Sunday. And that's there. But the bigger portion of this scripture says that we need to be helping one another. Encouraging one another. The thing is, you can't get encouragement from somebody you're not around. You ever figured that out? Somebody can't help you if you're not there to have them help you. How many realize, from, for the most part, your doctor can't help you if you don't go see them, right? Now, nowadays, I know we do some stuff online, and you can, you can do things like that. But normally, if you call the doctor's office, they'll say one of two things. When can you come in or go to the emergency room? Either way, they're wanting a physical contact. They want to see you. <coughs> and if we're going to encourage one another and spur one another on to love and good deeds, we need to be together. 1 Corinthians chapter, tw chapter 1, or 1 Corinthians, talks about that we're the body of Christ. And other scriptures speak how we're this body that we're a part of helps one another. 
We look at scriptures and we see in the early church that they encouraged one another. They met together. Often. Actually, scriptures it talks about in the early church they met together daily as they could. To hold one another accountable and to help each other. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse number 12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A three-chord strand is not quickly broken. A lot of times we, let, we uh, look at that Ecclesiastes scripture about the two-fold strand and three-folds can't be broken. We talk about marriage. The two come together and God's with them and those three-fold come together. And it talks about if two are watching out for each other, they can help protect each other. How many can, Steve, how many is here today? 53. 53. How many can 53 help protect against? A little bit more, don't you think? The only problem is, if we come together as 53 individuals, I'm here taking care of me and I don't care about you, we're going to fail. We need one another. John and Charles Wesley understood they needed help. When they were young in their faith, they began to meet with a small group of people at Oxford to talk about holiness and to try to encourage each other. Later, Wesley found gatherings with other groups that spurred him on to work for God. John and Charles was in a group with a man called Charles Whitfield. Some people call him Whitefield, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Whitfield, who encouraged them to preach in the field to minors. At which John Wesley originally did not feel encouraged about going to do this. But Whitfield encouraged him. Says, you need to come out, you need to preach. And when he went out, thus began what became the Wesleyan revivals. And how did this take place? Because Wesley was with a small group of people talking about how they can grow and do things for God. If he hadn't been in that group, who knows what could have happened. But as these groups came together, they did not originally form a different church. They were all considered themselves Anglicans because that was the official church of England, but they started gathering together in groups called societies, oftentimes on a Sunday night or other times during the week. It was at these society meetings that scripture was taught, preaching was given, testimonies were given, and prayer and song was put together. It was basically, it was a worship service, kind of like what we would have today. At one of these meetings in 1742, in a town called Linden, not London, Linden, <laughs> a society joined together and built what was called the New Room. The problem was they built this building on credit. They didn't ask John and Charles what they thought of that. They didn't like credit. They thought it was horrible. They'd seen their dad thrown in debtor's prison. So they didn't want anything to do with debt. But the problem was the society that was meeting didn't, wasn't raising enough money to pay for it. So this crisis they met, John Wesley and some others, they were saying, what should we do? So they, one gentleman, Captain Fro, got up and said, here's what we should do. We should break the society up in groups of 12. There were 12 disciples, there were 12 apostles, there were 12 tribes. So let's break the society up in groups of 12, and when they come together, each one will contribute a penny. They'd meet weekly, and they would each one contribute a penny to help take care of the debt. This idea was immediately rejected, because they said, this would disadvantage the poor. How would people feel if they came together in a meeting and everybody else could give and they couldn't? And Captain Fro said, hold it. What do we have in the Bible? We have a Bible of the example of Barnabas. 
when other people couldn't pay, couldn't make it, what did he do? He sold what he had to contribute to help the common need. He said, let's do this. Let's have them meet together. And if one person can't give, we don't shame them. We have someone else say, hey, I'll cover for you. I'll help you out. Especially they encouraged the class leader to be that person. And with that idea, they said, okay, let's do this. And this amazing thing started happening. They met, started meeting together. They, they gathered together in their small groups. And the money was raised, but also something else was happening. As they got together, they started asking each other, how, do you, how are you struggling? How are you doing trying to list these rules that Wesley is giving? This holy life that we're asked to do. How are you doing? And it was a, it was a discussion time. And Wesley realized within a year that this is an opportunity. And so he structured the classes to join together, to take up the offering, and then to look one at one another and ask a question. Actually, I would ask several, but it basically comes up to this one question. How is your soul? How are you doing spiritually? And every week they would get together, and the main purpose was not studying the Bible. It wasn't about a, necessarily a prayer time. It was they would look one another in the eye and say, how are you doing, in our terminology, how are you doing spiritually? How's your soul? And Wesley found that as these groups came together and asked that question, something amazing happened. These people got stronger. They were actually living out the Christian life. And all of a sudden, more people wanted to join these classes these groups, because now they found people around them that could help them. I don't know, have you ever had a time in your life where you wish somebody would just come around and say, how are you doing? And you just wanted to say, you know what, it stinks this week. I'm struggling. And they would just come around you and just pray for you. As these classes got together, they were a diverse group of people. And all of a sudden, the guy in the factory who owned the factory was sitting next to the guy who was working in the factory. And all of a sudden, he was realizing that his factory worker was starving on his watch. And people started changing. Because now they weren't just in their own little clique. They were in this group of differing people who would ask each other and actually cared, are you doing okay? How are you doing? And it was supposed to be an understanding that you were supposed to be honest. If you were having a bad day, you were supposed to say it. If you were struggling, you were supposed to tell it. And as the class meetings, many people think it was the revival, the preaching, that caused the Wesleyan movement to just spread all across the globe. But actually it was the class and band meetings, and we'll talk about the band meetings in a minute, which were the things that caused Methodism to grow. In fact, Methodism started declining once, we, once they started letting go of the class meetings. They, started, they continued to grow for a while because they started doing mergers. And yeah, you know what? If we, if we allowed Selma, or the, the campus, Selma campus to join us, we would grow. But did we really grow? No. History shows that when we let go of this accountability, this 
thing together. Methodism fades. The thing about it is people have looked and they said, How do, what do we need to do? Should we need to recapture these class meetings to have these groups come together? How do we do this? And many churches have tried it, and let me tell you honestly, most of them have failed. It's like, why won't they catch? And this last week I was talking to a gentleman about this, and he had mentioned something. He said, if you notice something about the class meetings, when they originally came together, they came together for a purpose. A purpose that was greater than themselves. We're coming together to try to take care of this debt. We're trying to come together once the debt was paid to raise money for another cause. In other words, when they really, one of the reasons they gathered wasn't originally always for accountability, it was for a cause. And when you remove the cause, it's harder to come together just to have somebody look at you and say, how are you doing spiritually? Because sometimes that's a hard question to answer. You say, Brother Charles, are we going to start bank class meetings or something like that here at the church? I'd like to. How are we going to do it? Let's me be honest here. I have no clue. We need to figure out how we need to try to hold one another accountable in some way. How we can encourage one another in groups that are beyond just our buddies and our friends. Because if we want to grow, especially in a world that's so much against Christianity, we need this. Now, I'll tell you right now, right now, our, the men, when we meet on Saturday morning, that's one of the things I told them. We're going to meet, we're going to eat. That's, that's our reason for coming together, to meet, eat. Because <laughs> that's always a good reason to get together. Oh, come on, guys, that was a perfect chance to say Amen. Eating is always a good chance to come together. Amen. All right. <laughs> so we come together, and, and after we eat, we look at one another, we ask, how is your soul? Well, there's just two, two things going on. First of all, this is a private time. We don't go share it with other people. We don't judge, and we pray for one another. And you know what? I found out a lot about people during that time, about some of these men. And I know some of them struggle. But I know they love God. And they want to grow and continue in their faith. But you know what? They have bad days. And guess what? You all do. We all do, don't we? We need this. Say, how are we going to do something? I don't know. I told you when I came here, if I don't know the answer, I will tell you. I don't know. But I am going to tell you, we need to find ways to encourage one another and to be willing to look at one another and say, how is your soul? And do it in a way that's loving and concerned and not in any way thinking, how is your soul? but one that says, oh, she's going to be leaving, so I need to pick on her more, right? <laughs> Instead of standing over, getting down that person's level and say, how are you doing? And really, really meaning it. Scripture says we need this. We need accountability. We need people to ask, how is our soul? We need to encourage one another. We need people to just to pray for us and maybe just pray, God, I don't know what to do, but we need you. John Wesley believed the class meeting helped to recapture several principles that was found in early Christian Christianity, 
early New Testament Christianity. One that was personal growth within fellowship. Coming together and, and encourage one another to grow, but also having this time of fellowship. It gave accountability. It gave us the opportunity to bear one another's burden because if you didn't have the money, guess what? I was going to put in for you. And gave you the ability to speak the truth in love and also maybe teaching you how to do that. Sometimes that's the one we got to practice. Learning how to do that. See, these are biblical principles. Not just what Wesley threw out there and say, oh, let's try this. But Wesley developed the band meeting because he found out that there were some places and some people that needed to ask a little bit more pointed questions because they were struggling in some area of their life. And these bands were developed by groups of like people. Single men would get together. Single women. Married women. Widows. Married men. Usually in groups of three to five and these groups joined together because there was a specific need, something greater going on. The bands were there to help people grow in love and increase in holiness. A chance for them to purify intentions because let's, let's you, know, you can be sort of vague in a group of people saying, yeah, I'm struggling this week. But maybe you can't say why you're struggling. Because there's a, it feels like there are way too many people. But you get in a small group, three to five, of people who are like you, who understand where you're coming from, who understand the struggles you face. They can look at you and help you. Here's the questions that were asked at band meetings. One. What known sins have you committed since our last meeting? Anybody ready for that one? Anybody want to get up here? Okay, okay. Yep. So you want to get up here in front of everybody and answer this question? Oh, come on. How many sins? We don't want to ask that question, do we? <laughs> what sins have you knowingly committed since our last meeting? Ouch. What temptations have you met? Here's a good one. How were you delivered? So it wasn't just about how did you fail, but how did you overcome? What have you thought, said, or done which you're not sure whether or not it was sin? How many of you have ever done something like, should I really have done that? Yeah, we've all done things like that, right? Afterwards, it's like, I'm not sure if that was right or not. Sometimes we need people around us to say, you know what? You were okay. And sometimes we need people to look at us and say, Charles, you're an idiot. You just, no. You know, I'm sure Dale would be glad to tell me that. <laughs> what have I unleashed? And the last one, are you keeping any secrets? These are very, very intimate questions. That's why the groups were small. By the way, say, did this band come along with anything or have any fruit? Yeah, how have you ever heard of something called AA? The idea of AA was birthed in a band meeting. People struggling with the same issue coming together and say, hey, I've got a problem and I need help. If you look, actually, if you look at the 12 steps, they're very Christian. Yeah, they've generic, made it generic, and I, we believe in some higher power. But the truth is, it's based in Christian faith. Because if you're going to overcome your sins, you need believe in God. And you need people around you to help you. And especially if you have an addiction. And you know what I figured out in my life? We all have an addiction. That addiction is sin. And we need God and those around us to help us. We need sometimes to find people in our lives 
to hold us accountable at a higher level. I have some people like that in my life. They'll regularly, I'll we'll talk to them occasionally, regularly, try to make it regularly, not as regularly as they used to because they're in different places now. We'll call and talk. How are you doing? Are you struggling with anything? What about, and they'll name something uh, that I've had a problem with in the past or something's going on. It's like, I really wish you wouldn't ask. <laughs> or I can say, thankfully, I'm doing good. God's shown me some things that I need to do so I can overcoming that. It was during the, one of these meetings, actually, that I, find, I figured out that, as for me at least, if I write, actually write, either st write stuff out, write fictional stories, whatever, I sin less. That may not be your thing. Maybe your thing is, I'll pick on somebody sitting right here. <coughs> I won't mention her name. You know, crocheting may be your thing. When you're crocheting, you send less. I don't know. Maybe not. We'll just go there. But God, if you're in a group and you ask and you start talking things out, guess what? You can find out what are, what's going on in your life. And maybe you can find out what actually helps you. See, we need each other. In the Global Methodist Church, we're moving to an area where we have greater accountability. Now, we're not starting off trying to ask all of you to do stuff. We're trying to hold ourselves more accountable. Those of us in leadership, those who are pastors. Not just coming together when you're getting ordained and say, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe these doctrines? We're going to follow up regularly saying, how are, you, how are you doing? How is your soul? And are you still holding to the truth of the Word of God? One of the things that... They're, they're encouraging us to do is as pastors to talk amongst each other. Because guess what? We're usually, we're the same type of folk. In small groups saying, how are you doing? Are you struggling? What's happening? Because if we don't hold one another accountable, if we don't want, hold one another and help one another and lift each other up, what's going to happen? You know, you might be a Christian, but let me tell you something. If you don't accept accountability in your life, then John Wesley may say you're saved, but guess what? You're probably not a Methodist. Not really. The Methodist Church has long since left following up band and class meetings. As the Methodist Church became more and more popular and more and more rich, they, were more, they didn't want to ask the rich people How's your soul? How are you doing? They didn't want to hold each other accountable as much. And with the rise of Sunday school, they thought, if we're doing Sunday school, why do we need the class meetings? So they let them go. And as I mentioned before, Methodism has struggled ever since. Because if a church is going to grow, a church is going to make a difference, we need Groups that help each other, encourage one another. Nowadays, we usually call them something called small groups. We need these groups that meet together and help one another. The world around us is telling us, go a different way. Everything, I, th I think everything you see on TV today will tell you to forsake God and do your own thing. And if not the show, then definitely the commercial you just watched. We need one another. We need one another if we're going to grow. If we're going to be all that God wants us to be. What do we need to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is just to be willing to say, God, find me a group that I can help and that can help me. And be willing to put ourselves in a place where we are held accountable. Because let me tell you something, one of these days we are going to be held accountable. And I think I want to be held accountable 
now and get it worked out rather than at the end of time? I mean, how, just for one example, how many of you like, I'll pick on the kids here, the young guys. You know, how many of you have turned in a paper early and had the professor or the teacher mark on it what they thought about it? You're not getting a grade, but you're getting the criticism. Don't you just love getting that paper back? Not really. Because <laughs> usually it says, good point, need work, lots of work. You know, paper is 3,000 words short <laughs> or something, you know. We don't like that criticism, do we? That criticism better than getting an F, right? I don't know, you, you want to take an F home? And guess what? I don't want to take an F home in life. So I need people to come along and say, here's some idea. Here's some ways to make it better. We need one another if we're going to be all that God wants us to be. If we're going to catch a vision of what God wants for us. Dear Father, I ask now as we prepare to sing this song together that God, you would show us the right way to help one another grow in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Thou art, be thou my vision. us a vision of you in our hearts and in our lives as we go forth here today. And God, may your spirit richly bless each one that's come out here today. Walk with them and let them feel your love as they go forth. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen.